Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Galen Research Talk. It's fantastic that you could join us here uh, for the people who are live, but also those people who might be joining us um, via the web. The Galen Research Talk, if you're unaware of it, it's really a platform where faculty, students, uh, Galen guests can come and present and discuss research ideas, preliminary results of uh, research, conceptual ideas, book reviews, anything that has to do with research. And um, if there's anybody who's interested in presenting, they can always contact me at fpenaros at gmail, at, sorry, at galenedu.bz, or um, you can just contact me in person at the office here at the Galen campus. Uh, if you want to organize a talk, if you want to suggest a speaker, also that's, it's, um, that would be really welcomed as well. So we have a series of talks coming up, and we start the series uh, this morning with a talk titled Student-Centered Education, and it's about exploring the implications and pathways for small education institutions. You know, many times there are terms that are banded around such as student-centeredness, but what does it mean? What does it mean for a small university to adopt this idea of student-centeredness? Um, what are the possible pathways of getting there? So today's talk is going to explore that. And to do that, we have a speaker, uh, Dean Sherry Gibbs, who many of you might be familiar with, but Dean Sherry Gibbs has a master's in anthropology, in bioarchaeology uh, from Trent University. She has worked for many years in the field. She's written numerous reports uh, about bioarchaeology here in Belize and Texas. She has also been uh, very instrumental in shaping the anthropology and archaeology education in Belize. And particularly here at the university, she designed the, the bachelor's program in anthropology. She is the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science and Technology. And you know, she's always interested in seeing the programs expand and grow and become more responsive to Belize. She's currently enrolled in a PhD program. And one of the themes that she's exploring is this question of student-centeredness. Does student-centeredness mean that we should just bend backward and students should do whatever it is that they want? What does it mean, right? Um, and what are the implications for it? So it should be something of interest both to faculty and students. So uh, I want to welcome uh, Sherry Gibbs. So if you give her a round of applause and we'll hand her over the mic. Hi, morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Dr. Panados, for that introduction. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be presenting to you all today and part of this lecture series and to be the first one to launch it for this academic year. Um, as Dr. Panados had mentioned, I have just started uh, an EDD program out of University of Western Ontario back in Canada. Um, it's been a while since I've been at school, so this is a whole new experience for me. And it's really interesting to be on the side that many of you are. And so I really appreciate the students that have shown up. Um, and I think this is really appropriate for you to be here for this presentation because it's all about you um, and how institutions, how Galen could best represent um, and serve you. Um, and so, as I was saying, being on the side of the student has definitely given me a whole new perspective, even though I try to remember when I was back in school, um, oftentimes it would be more of, I would never say or do that, um, or, you know, ask an instructor or a professor the questions that I see get asked. Um, but it's interesting now that I find myself in your shoes, having similar questions that you all would have. Um, and what got me thinking about student-centeredness, it's something that those of us at Galen here and administration, we've been talking about for quite some time um, to be student-centered. And we have this idea that we want to be student-centered, but as Dr. Bernardo had mentioned, I think it's one of those phrases, terms that we're using and I'm not really sure how familiar, what we really know, how we understand it, and the impact that it has for all of us as an institution. So the overview of this presentation, I'm going to look at what is student-centeredness, why student-centeredness, some global examples, the relevance of it, um, what it's going to take for us to really become a student-centered institution, and then close us out. 
but the student centered journey and it really is a journey. Um, and so to start off looking at the what and the why. Anybody out there want to shout out what you think student centeredness is? You coming to Galen, you hear that Galen is a student centered institution. What are you expecting then? Responsiveness. Anyone else? Anything that you expect, you come to Galen, you're being told that we're student centered, you get here, maybe you're expecting certain things. Are you surprised by things that maybe you aren't seeing or aren't experiencing? Or are you experiencing everything that you would expect a student centered institution to be offering? Um, Anyone else? Any of the students? Not yet? Okay, let me go on. Um, maybe at some point you may feel like sharing, and please at any time just jump in. Um, in the literature, and there have been various definitions, um, they keep changing depending on the time that we're in, depending on the institution, depending on where we are. Um, so time period, generations, what's happening around the world, where you're located and what's happening in your area. And then of course, what the institution, um, what the institution is, is interested and in, what they feel is student-centeredness. But placing the student at the center of their educational journey, that focus and emphasis on the student. And to me, that kind of, you're at a university, you're at an academic institution, that would seem sort of obvious. You would think that that's what should be happening at an academic institution. But many academic institutions, you will find, may focus more on research. Galen is a teaching institution. There are some institutions, some universities, that are more research-focused, and the teaching is sort of a byproduct, um, especially if you've got faculty members who are focused and hired for their research. You will have institutions where professors are just researchers. If they teach a course, it might be at a graduate level, maybe a PhD level course, but they're not going to be teaching in the undergrad um, level. It considers all stages of the student's journey, and I'll show you this in a little bit of how Galen's um, journey sort of maps out for students. But all of your stages from when you are considering coming to Galen or any institution, applying what that process is like, getting in um, your first day of class, your advising sessions, all the way through up to graduation and beyond for some. Recognizing also, and this is really important, that no student is the same. All of you are very different. You're all coming from different backgrounds. You have different expectations. You have different programs. Your ideas of what you're going to do after school are most likely very different. So no student is the same and no journey is going to be the same. I gave this similar, well, a very um, very shortened presentation back for faculty and staff before the semester started. And I was asking faculty what they considered to be student-centeredness. And so I took what they had commented and I thought I would include it here. 
And a lot of it is what Dr. Aguilar had mentioned, what Dr. Barrow had mentioned, and what I had also mentioned originally, coming from um, some of the literature. Putting students first, focusing on what the student needs. So needs are important. Interest and well-being of students is the priority. Ensuring the needs and success of our students are met. Empowering each individual to chart their unique path guided by personalized support such as peer mentoring, tutoring, mental health counseling, innovative pedagogy, collaborative engagement. I would also include here advising. And then, because I'm sorry I wrote on the board, being readily available to guide or assist students through their university life, the assistant would enable the students to make informed decisions about their academic careers. This Sound okay and it sounds nice to you? Do you feel like you're seeing that right now? We have a couple first year students. We've got some students who've been here for at least a year now. Do you feel like you're being put first? Do you feel that you're being empowered? Do you feel that your needs and your success here are being met? Yeah? Great. Why is this important? And why is it something that's seen as essential? And there's really um, interesting discussions out there in the literature, um, those that support and promote student-centered learning, student-centered learning and teaching, student-centered institutions. There's different names for it. It could be learner-centered, um, person-centered. I've just chosen to use student-centered for this purpose. I also want to back up too, because I just kind of launched in without saying that um, this is a very um, basic introductory look at this concept and this idea. Um, as Dr. Panados had mentioned, I'm looking at doing this for my, thanks, Christine. for my program. And so I'm really just starting to get into what this is, what this means for Galen. Is this something that Galen even wants to actually commit to? Because there's a lot more than just, it's easy to say that we're going to put students first and address your needs, be available to guide and assist you. It's really easy to say these things, but when we put it into practice, it means something completely different. But also too, looking at why this is seen as essential. And as I was going through all of the readings, it really struck me that it wasn't so much of what the students are going to get out of it. It's what the um, these researchers, the instructors, those interested in pedagogy are saying, okay, this is important because it's promoting upper level of Bloom taxonomy of learning objectives. And only I think a small handful of you would be familiar with what this is, but this would be to apply, analyze, evaluate, and to create in your classes and what you're learning. So you're able to apply what you've learned, you're able to analyze it, evaluate, and be creative with it. So this is this upper level of learning. It is, it should be able to emphasize the quality of the knowledge construction process. So again, really speaking up to this idea of the upper levels of what Bloom is talking about for your learning. It's meeting the learner's needs, but it's pretty vague and whatever those needs are, because you could come in with all different kinds of needs, but they might not be really appropriate for an institution like this to address. And it's supposed to lead to student success, which is what all institutions out there are saying that they're doing. We want you to succeed. We want our students to be able to get what? What's the purpose of you being here? to get a job. Is that what you all thought when you first came here to Galen? You're coming to Galen because you want what? Right. 
Why, Brandon? To become a job. To become a to get a job, Iran. Fantastic. Great. Anyone else want to share? Do you think that a student-centered education is essential? From just a little bit that you've heard, that it would be essential for you and maybe assist with your with your learning, it's going to meet you as the learners, needs lead to greater success for you. Um, but it struck me, and I was saying when I was going through, I could and keep in mind that I'm just diving into this, and even though I've got tons of um, articles and chapters, trying to find where the students themselves are saying why it was kind of interesting. It was lacking, I found, um, in the literature. And so it's something that I think I might like to explore some more um, on our end. And so we'll sure. Yeah. 
Intuition. It should be a play of your own intuition to the sense that um, most adults have a more mature mind and so they would be able to decipher whether the student is taking advantage of the blessing that has been put upon them or whether it's genuine. So it's just up to whoever is the... Um, don't know what to say. Whoever is the teacher in the scenario, whoever is the teacher in the scenario to be able to decipher the situation and notice if this student is trying to take advantage or if it's something that they actually need done. And as I like to say, you don't the school to take advantage. I think that the student should the, the nature of humans is to take advantage. That is the not no. Not all students, but the nature, the nature of humans is to take advantage of the situations provided to them, right? And so, personally, as a student, I wouldn't want to take advantage of that because I'm thinking for myself future-wise, and I know if I take advantage of this situation, it would not be a benefit for me in the future. This is why it's really important on the teacher's behalf to be able to decipher this because we're all growing young people. We haven't developed our senses properly, some of us, right? Some of us will say, hey, this is the thing. I can take advantage of this. I'll submit my homework 10 days afterwards and get away with it because it's my control. Now, that is something I believe that would be easy to look into in some cases. And that is why I'm saying that it's a big responsibility on the faculty or the teacher to be able to pick out those students. Because as said, human nature to take advantage of any situation given to us. You need to come here. And if you're not interested in showing up to class, taking notes, paying attention, doing your assignments, it is not my responsibility to come to you and say, what's going on? And so we can have discussions of enabling. Um, I think that I've caught myself, I will admit, I may be a bit of an enabler. Um, faculty will email me about a student. I will, who's their advisor, I will loop the dean and the advisor in to say, something's going on with the student, I don't know. But for me, I'm thinking, Maybe they need, maybe they need some assistance, some help. Maybe they don't feel their needs are being met. Do we need to refer them to the counselor? Do they, can they not afford to come to classes? But is that really my responsibility to say, all right, let's go, come on. I'll call you up and say, you haven't been to class in two days. What's happening? What do we need to do to get you in? 
I believe you should be reaching out to the students that you see trying to get things done. You have done that for me before. We, me and you had that situation where I'm in a problem with my classes and I didn't mention it because I felt a way about reaching out for help. And you called me into your office and you said, hey, I noticed you weren't entering your classes, what's going on? And I came to you and I spoke with you. And after speaking with you, I picked up and I started managing a little bit better with that class. And so some students are out there who are genuinely trying and it's back to the good suffer for the bad, but I don't think the good should suffer for the bad. When, when we're in Belize and we're clean with beans, we pick out the bad beans. We don't find two bad beans and throw away all the beans. We pick out the bad beans and I think that is that should be our approach. So we shouldn't give up on everyone because of one of two bad sports, right? You pick out the bad sports and you let them know, hey, we see what you're doing, it's not working, step up or step out, right? Because we have actual students who have actual problems in the school, trying to get their work done, trying to get their life sorted out. And some of us um, jumped from high school straight to university, not knowing that, oh, university is this big switch. Some of us thought that, I'm coming to paradise. I got this wrapped. And it's, it's the truth. And so in that way, it's really important for those exact students to have people to reach out to. It's scary when you don't have any anyone to come to, to talk about for your classes, to talk about different things that you're going through. It's really, really a bad situation. In um, primary school, I believe it was primary school, we had this culture where the teachers were supposed to be like very strict. They were supposed to strike fear into the hearts of the students. That was a really bad effect because students would never talk about what was going on. Maybe they'd show up without their homework and the teacher doesn't want to hear it. You come with your homework. There was this time where a teacher told us a story. One of her, one of her students got hit by a car on the way to school. And she just came to school because she was afraid of being marked as absent. Yeah, because now for me, we don't want to talk about class, they don't ask questions because they were never allowed to think for themselves. That critical thinking that's so super important. Um, there were a number of things that I was going to talk to you on that, and I've kind of forgotten about them now. That's beautiful thing student-centered philosophy, because it's a philosophy. Now, who uses philosophy need to define? So, Sacred Heart College might say we are student-centered, but their student-centered meaning might be a little bit different from us. Is that something yeah. that you see we having to do or any other institution who uses the term we are student centered, would need to define and possibly do a education campaign to their students so they themselves understand and appreciate and are able to use use the 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 philosophy, put it to, to use and and um, take advantage of, um take advantage of using it, benefit, maybe the word is the benefit from it, rather than not at taking advantage, but benefit from it and use what it has to offer to you, the, um, the students. And so we can better fulfill that, manifest that philosophy, and you, the students, can then benefit from, from it. Yeah. So as I move along, that's going to be shown that that's what's extremely important for the institution. And I'm gonna kind of move along and show the different aspects of it um, that you need. If a university, if an institution like ours is going to say we are student-centered, we need to have a statement. We need to have a philosophy. We need to have it in our mission and vision. And we all need to be 100% on board or um, it's not gonna happen and there's going to be more problems than, than anything coming out of it. Um, and so these two researchers came up with this 
idea of student-centered ecosystems. So I'm just referring it to SCE. Um, student-centered ecosystems are culturally sensitive. They're flexible, interactive systems of the student-centered learning and teaching in higher education. Um, and so I have four aspects of it here. It should reflect the institutional values and norms or the institutional values and norms should be reflected. Sorry, I like to wander. Um, should be reflected in the student-centered learning and teaching. And the learning and teaching is what's mostly taking place in the classroom. That's where the teaching is happening. That's where students are learning. But we also know that a lot of your learning doesn't take place right in the classrooms. It's taking place outside. So like what's happening right now, what's also happening down in Harpy 5, where we've got first aid training happening. Um, we've been trying to introduce more activities to get students involved, to expand on your learning outside of the classroom. Clubs are another example of that. Um, take the wider political, economic, social, and cultural development into account. And that's kind of what I was referring to a little bit before, where each institution's idea of student-centeredness has to do with where they are, um, politically, where they're located. Um, I will give you some examples. Um, I've been reading up of what it's like in China, Philippines, um, Namibia, the US, Canada, the EU, and they all have different ways of looking at it. And in some instances, it's either the country that's taking control and saying, this is what you're going to do, or for Europe, it's the EU mandating it. Um, for us right now, we're seeing with the Ministry of Education, they're mandating that primary and secondary schools become competency-based. Um, it's possible that this may eventually come to the tertiary level. So at Galen, we may have to start teaching in competency-based style um, of teaching. For the education students, they need to get that in their classes which could mean then that the general education core courses that our teacher students take need to be taught from that perspective. Um, and that's being mandated by the government. Um, and then of course, social and cultural developments that are happening within the country, within your region, or within your institution. It's guided by inter inter international and institutional policies and strategies. So I was mentioning um, in China, for example, um, there's some interesting things happening on Hong Kong. I mentioned the EU and then what's happening right now in Belize with regards to competency-based learning, um, but the institutional policies and strategies. So if we are going to be a student-centered institution, this has to be into our policies. It has to be part of our strategic plan. This has to be embedded in every single thing that we have and that we're doing. Our academic policies have to be full of it. The student handbook has to be there so that everybody is clear. Um, and then required institutional reform and policies to, of course, support that. And so this is going to require a lot of reform and a lot of buy-in. Um, and this, I just took a figure from um, Hodden and Klemenkic, um article. This is components of institutional student-centered ecosystems framework that they came up with. And so there's five different levels to this. Um, and the five components in higher education institutions include the curriculum, pedagogy, and, ass and assessment. That's what's happening in your classrooms right now, or ideally would be. The assessments that you're taking, um, your pathways, the program that you're in. The teaching and learning support this is what's there for your instructors. Being in a classroom and being able to have a student-centered um, classroom experience requires that your instructors understand what it means to teach in a student-centered manner. Um, the quality of learning and teaching, so our QA office is then involved in this. They have to be a part of this and have to be monitoring and making sure that everything that is happening in the classroom is student-centered. The institutional governance and administration part, so the deans, the provosts, the board of directors, um, everybody is involved, the finance office, your student affairs office, your registrar, all of those offices 
are part of this. And then institutional policies and finance. And I haven't gotten into finance yet. So all of those policies that we have when I mentioned the academic policies, our strategic plan, all of that is now encompassing all of the other four that I spoke about. But finance is super important. Um, when I get into some of the examples, um, what it costs to invest in a student-centered classroom. Uh, right now, yes, well, yesterday I walked into the library and into Harpy 6 and there was no AC. It was extremely hot. Um, but we market ourselves as being student-centered and that we have this to offer students. And we have facilities that are AC. But a bunch of students were hanging out in there and it was really hot. And we don't have any ACs. But the faculty and the admin are all sitting in their offices with AC. And it struck me as being a little bit off. Um, but we managed to get... Um, the support and so the finances are good we can get ACs to replace that and hopefully by the end of this week the library and that classroom will be back up and functioning again but it costs a lot of money to be a student-centered institution um, and then from this same research Clemente she came up with this um, well, her 10 mutual reinforcing core elements um, to be student-centered um, learning and teaching institution. You have the policies, rules, and regulations that are enabling student-centered learning and teaching. And so there, that cog is interacting with the student-centered curriculum and pedagogy, which then goes to the assessment that you're getting in your classes, your tests, your papers, whatever assignments that you get. There are flexible learning pathways. And so the pathway that we're always telling you, you must follow the pathway. And if you get off, too bad for you, you're gonna to have to pay extra. This is the pathway, don't deviate from it. But looking at maybe there's learning or flexible pathways. The learner support, our peer mentors, our tutoring, um, we might need to increase our tutors and our peer mentors and the support for teachers. So again, I mentioned it's not just about students, we have to support our faculty and a lot of our faculty are adjuncts. That's just the nature of how we are. We have a small full-time staff we rely heavily on experts in the field, but they don't have any teaching background. Actually, I don't know if there's any of our faculty members that we have brought in who are, are full-time instructors who have an education background and have been taught how to teach. You don't just, it's not something that you just necessarily know how to do, but we expect then these individuals who have full-time jobs to come in and to teach you and to do it properly and now we want them to shift everything and to teach from a student-centered perspective. Active learning spaces and academic libraries. And so this student-centered classrooms, what do we need to do to mix things up? Um, we're gonna be getting a STEM lab and I would challenge Dr. Barrow and Dr. Aguilar to think about what they would like to see their lab look like and how is it going to be interactive? How is it going to be a student-centered STEM lab? Because that means designing. We're not just going to have a square building and plunk some tables in it and that's it. What can we do to make this more conducive to student learning? Um, learning technology infrastructure. We all know that we've been struggling with Moodle. We've been struggling with our servers. What do we need to do to increase that and make that more um, accessible for students? Do we need to talk to BEL and SMART to boost the internet access down south for our students who live in these villages? Because we cannot exclude anybody. If you come from um, Aguacate, if you come from um, San Pedro, Colombia, or Poite, or yeah, San Benito Poite, you don't have internet, does that mean that you just don't get to go to school? It's not acceptable. So we need to figure out how we can bring everybody in to get them the education. And so that's when we're talking about even back at marketing and talking to students, how we can make all of this accessible for them. Community learning connections and partnerships, how we work with the community. Can we connect with the two schools that are right by us, St. Barnabas? Can we connect with organizations that are out there that then students can go and do internships, can go and partner with them so that we can have these synergies that are so important. And then, of course, quality assurance. So Dr. Harrison is here as our quality assurance director, who's going to support 
all of this. And you can see how it's all interconnected. Okay, I've been talking about the global examples, so I'll talk about them now. Um, I'm looking at, actually I have six or seven, um, but I have five up here first. Um, in Japan, so these are just examples of how institutions or instructors have taken on what they feel to be the importance of student-centeredness and how they can um, incorporate it into their classes. Um, the Central Council for Education, which is an advisory board to their Ministry of Education and Culture, Sports and Technology in Japan. Um, so this advisory board um, is saying that they need to address active learning as a means to improve graduates' attributes, meeting the needs of society and business. And so if we're looking at education as a means to an end, because we're hoping that, well, I was really happy to hear that it's not just to get a job, but what you can do in your communities, um, how you can better um, your communities and the life for others and animals as well, or ecosystems. They're looking at how we can better serve than business and societies. Um, two major issues that this one instructor found, and this sort of speaks to what we were talking about earlier, I think with Iran, two major issues is students' passive attitudes. So you ask a question and it's just a sea of nothingness or there's crickets. It's the worst to be in an online class and you be the instructor and you ask a question and there's absolutely nothing. It is like work. Like out there, nobody hears what you're playing or what you're saying. It's really um, almost heartbreaking. <laughs> so if any of you have given presentations in your classes, um, pay attention next time when somebody else is giving a, a presentation. Listen and ask questions, at least make them think that you um, you appreciate what they're doing and you're interested a little bit. So student passive attitudes and classroom sleeping. Students sleep in class. Students sleep in on-campus classes, right? You all know, you've seen students do it. They hide behind their computers. Some just straight up put their head on the table. I have seen this and it's just, get out get out but i'm sure that a lot of more of it happens when um your online classes it's so easy you log in so you're present you've showed up for class and then you zone out go to sleep do whatever okay so what um this researcher said is i'm going to take what the the council for education is saying about addressing active learning how can we incorporate active learning which is kind of a, along the lines of being student-centered. It's a type of um, pedagogy, I guess, that gets introduced into the classroom. Um, and so they chose role-playing. And they wanted to see, is this going to be able to increase student involvement? Are my students still going to sleep? Um, will they get more involved? Will their passive attitudes change? Or will they just hate it? and kind of revolt and say, uh, I'm not doing this at all. And so he went through and he found that while there were some students who didn't like it at all and just left and said, I'm not going to participate in this. Um, but this is a way to adapt theories to real life context. Dr. Harrison has talked to us um, in professional development sessions to instructors about how useful role play can be. Um, you can have students take on the role of um, a philosopher, um, a theorist, and say, okay, here's the situation. Now pretend you're the philosophers. You're going to have to read up. And what perspective are you going to take on a certain subject or on a certain um, situation? What he found at the end was students were no longer sleeping in class. Um, students weren't being um, just passive observers and not being involved and found that students actually really enjoyed their classes, showed up, were engaged and actually did much better in their classes than just leaving them alone. 
me personally, as a student, um, I know like the the okay, I want to mean slap on a PowerPoint, sit down and pay attention the entire like we have some teachers who are just like don't talk, we'll ask questions at the end of the very presentation, just watch. That um I forget what the study says, but apparently humans only have more uh, attention span up to 20 minutes i think i don't think it's I, I think something long. something like that right? yeah useful but and i've useful. blown over the 20 minutes now me personally the best classes i ever enjoyed the classes where um we have active discussions like we have actual like the topic whatever topic we talk about the teacher will try related to the class and so instead I be we to check on the role of a specific person, you know, be okay, put yourself in this situation. And it really work your brain because um I use one of the basic math questions from primary school. Tim bought five hundred apples at twenty five cents. You put tell somebody else putting yourself in that issues, it really get the um interactive. I mean, might not be the kind of impression we want, but that's an example, right? If you put me in the shoes at Tim, I'll be like why I'd buy 500 apples. <laughs> but at the end of that, you get the point where you try to get, I'd interact, I'd um, give you my attention now because you would try to involve me into your lesson rather than to just try to push this information for me. And so the learning isn't passive. The, oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to move on because I think I'm now really getting over and I was worried that I didn't have enough slides. Um, my example now from Canada, and this is at McGill University, which is in Montreal. They set up active learning classrooms. And so imagine that you sign up for an architecture program and you come into class and it's like this. And so the instructors and the ones who wrote this article said, all right, this needs to change. And they were able to get funds from the institution to say, we're going to create active learning classrooms. Um, and at the start, they talk about John Dewey. I don't know if any of you probably know who he is. I, um, an educator from a thousand years ago, um, pointing to the importance of ensuring that students are active in their learning process. If you give pupils something to do, not something to learn, the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking and then it will naturally lead to learning and that's what will result. And so they took the classrooms and being an architectural program, looked at how they could better design their classrooms to allow for that active learning, to bring students together so that they could do some brainstorming and be in an aesthetically pleasing space because space too is super important to this. So sometimes being in this room, it's not, okay, so we have this pretty mural here and maybe you can kind of zone out in the mural. The acoustics are horrible. Sometimes it gets too cold. Some, depending on where you're sitting, it gets too hot. Um, this isn't really a nice learning space. And each instructor does something a little bit different. And so the first day of class, the instructor who had their first class set it up in a U and it's just kind of stayed like that, which I think is nice as opposed to the regular you know, you got your backs to a whole slew of people behind you, or you're just staring at a sea of, of backs um, to make your learning experience more engaged and important. And so this is an example then of a program who said, we're going to switch things up and try to make this more learning centered by developing active learning classrooms. And what I was going to say with Iran, I think there are a lot of faculty that we have who are being student centered in their classrooms. We might not realize it. You probably don't even know. They may not even realize that that's what they're doing. And then, you know, sure, we have many who aren't at all. Um, in the UK, in London, at um, St. George's, excuse me, University of London. And what was interesting about St. George's is that they're linked with the University of Nicosia, which is in Cyprus. Uh, and so the University of St. George and the University of Nicosia have dual degree offerings. And at the University of Nicosia, it's the only medical university on the island of Cyprus. But Galen has some sort of loose connections with the University of Nicosia. So I thought that was kind of interesting. 
um, we can look at what St. George is doing and they are doing active organizational learning. And so the individuals who wrote this chapter, they're extending the tenets of active learning to organizational learning um, so that they can be truly transformative when transferred to organizational policy, strategies, and governance. And so they developed a Center for Innovation and Development of Education, which has a role that goes well beyond that of just training new instructors. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. We bring in all of these adjuncts or we hire new full-time faculty members who have no background in teaching. They've never had a class to help them learn how they're supposed to teach. They just have to figure it out on their own. Um, and so that's what this center is doing. It's also involved in policy and governance activities that support and enhance the pedagogical practice, including the design of effective quality strategies um, to help the instructors to meet the needs of the students and to be student-centered. In Namibia, similar sort of thing, they're offering postgraduate certificates in higher for instructors in the classroom. And it's something similar to what we've been doing. Dr. Harrison is oftentimes, um, along with Dr. Aguilar, will help new instructors who are coming in, even just basic things like how to use Moodle. So imagine you're being hired to come in. You've never used Moodle before. You don't know what Blackboard is. It's like being a student. You have to figure it out quick so that you can set up your class so that students can come in then. And you're supposed to be the expert, but you're at the same level as the students in terms of knowing how to maneuver around Moodle and Blackboard. Um, and their PD sessions include helping instructors figure out how to do flipped classrooms, reflective practice, micro-teaching, and classroom observations. Um, but what's recognized is that there really needs to be a culture change. And at any institution, when you're introducing something new, there has to be a culture change. And as any of us know, there's a lot of resistance and we just want to hold on to what we know um, because we think what we know is the best. And then at the US in Harvard, and so I thought I'd bring an example that I think a lot of people have heard about Harvard and they're doing similar things too at their Center for Learning, Teaching and Learning and Student-Centered Classrooms. Um, and so they see student-centered learning being motivated by what the students will do and learn both inside and outside of the classroom, which I was mentioning earlier. Um, and these are found around campuses, again, assisting faculty, graduate students, um, other instructors who interact with students on how to um, be more student-centered. And then at Cardiff University in the UK, they have four aspects of what it means to be student-centered for them. One is centering on students' physical and mental health and quality of life. This university has completely taken student-centeredness, that philosophy, and incorporated it into their whole institution. Um, the physical and mental health and quality of life, I think we're doing a pretty good job. We have our counselor. We, it almost seems sometimes like we may need an extra counselor because I know booking times now are getting um, further away. A student might need immediate need, but find they can't get an appointment until two weeks time. So it's good. It's fantastic that students are taking advantage of the service that we're able to offer this. Um, but it's also a little concerning to me that more and more students are needing this. So there, it speaks to me that there's something going on out there um, and how can we better assist the physical aspect um, with sports? I know we're lacking facilities and that again, when we talk about the finance component of what's required to really be student-centered, how do we address the physical needs? We don't have a gym, we don't have a pool. When I went to school, there was a pool. You could get up and do laps if you wanted. You go to the gym, you get, there was indoor, there was, um, indoor facilities for basketball, volleyball, and all that sort of thing. Um, student participation. With student participation, this isn't just participation in class, kind of like what Iran was talking about, but this is student participation on campus, like SGA. I was happy 
that there was actually people who were we were able to have an election or you were able to have an election for your president and your vice president of the SGA. There have been times where nobody wants to run, which means there is no student voice. And this is extremely important to be a student centered institution, because if you do not have student buy in, we want to be student centered to better serve you. But if the students aren't interested, it's not going to work. So we can't just think that we want to do it to help you. But if you're not willing to kind of pull your own and to meet us at least halfway, um, there really isn't any point for us to do it. <clears throat> and so this is looking at participation in reform processes, participating in decision making of major issues of the university, like curriculum design, like the teaching process of teachers, the development of the university strategic plan writing of the university's annual quality report, teaching excellent framework, and so on. Um, when we're doing program review, part of it is to talk to students. When we first were looking at it, we had students actually, we wanted them to review the questionnaire. It was like pulling teeth to get students to do it. It is worse to get students to do class um, course evaluations. How many of you have done your course evaluations last year? Last night. No, I don't look at these guys. Do you do your course evaluation? No. You will hear from third and fourth hand students complaining about a course or an instructor. But when I look at the evaluations, I don't see it. That is the official way. That is how I know something has happened, right? It's like going to the police to report that a crime happened. People say that these crimes are happening, but they're not coming in. I don't know. I don't know what the real issue is. So students have to participate. Then the student learning experience. This is focusing on the future of students in terms of their the student learning outcomes, but also employment, um, further education, designing courses, training, and counseling to equip students with this measurable knowledge, skills, qualities, um, so that you can establish yourself in society. So it's not just here. We need to know that when you leave, you're going to be able to um, support your communities and do all of these wonderful things that you have in mind when you're here. And then the last one is um, student learning outcomes. And so this is the student learning process. And these are things like language, mathematics. So we have the writing center. I hope students start to take advantage of it. Um, we need to have a math or a numerical literacy or some sort of center to help students with math. Um, it's that important analytical skill that um, we want you to have and that those out there in society and employers need you to have. Um, and study skills, critical reading skills, how to read and how to think. Um, your instructors are expecting this of you, but if you've never had an opportunity to express this in your classes before, and then you get here and we're expecting you to read critically, think critically. We want you to write these essays. We want you to analyze this article. You just read the article. What am I supposed to do with it? Um, we have a lot of expectations of you, but we need to afford you the space and those opportunities to figure out how to do that. Things like avoiding plagiarism, um, teamwork, group work, how to be an effective group member. Okay, and then I've been talking um, a little bit already about what's going on in the EU. Um, there's the European Commission. And so, and this has been going on. So I've just taken the more recent one. But for quite some time, the European Commission um, um, so presents their EU agenda for higher education. And so this was a renewed um, request that they had submitted in 2017. And their statement was well-designed higher education programs and curricula centered on students' learning needs are crucial for effective skills development. And so the EU has taken this idea of really what it is to be student-centered and is requiring a sort of a mandate of the EU, whether all of the academic institutions buy into this and take it on is a whole other thing. But the European Student Union is advocating for the inclusion of student-centered learning 
in European level policies and for its implementation in higher education all over Europe. So this is being pushed by the European Student Union. Now we have a Belize Student Union. Yes, anybody know about the Belize Student Union? Or student, I think that's called the Student Union. Um, we did have one representative who sat on the union. Um, I think they tried to get somebody from, um, I think they tried to get somebody from, um, I'm over time, from Yale and UB and UE and some of the junior colleges. If you have the opportunity, I think it's really important um, to be able to represent students. But again, I'm not seeing that students want to be active participants. Um, and I've totally gone over time, but just to sort of highlight a little bit. <laughs> so despite the inclusion of student-centered learning in many of the European policies, a strong lobbying effort from the European Student Union and the support of other stakeholder organizations, there's reason to doubt to what degree a paradigm shift towards this has actually taken place. And several European level surveys conducted by the Students' Union suggesting that it's just inadequate. So while it's something that the students want, it's not happening. And the reason why the implementation is inadequate is that it's being conceptualized wrongly. And this is kind of going back to what Dr. Harrison was mentioning. Ideas and expectations of what it entails are misguided. So we don't understand what it is, or we may talk about it, and we're going to be student-centered, but not everybody is on board and knows what that means. Um, it's very rarely operationalized. So some are doing it, some aren't doing it, some think they're doing it, but they're not. The definition is sometimes too narrow. And policies on student-centered learning lack acknowledgement that students themselves need to be properly consulted on and prepared for this shift. So we can't talk about it in our meetings and say we're doing this for you, but not have you brought in and your input as to what it's going to mean for you and how it's going to impact you and whether you even want it in the first place. Like, do you want role playing going on in your classroom? Are you a student who'd be comfortable to do that? And some just aren't. I hear that or I see that we have to do activities even when we have meetings and I start to panic even at parties where you have to come up and you pull a number and you have to do some sort of song and dance, I start to freak out. So recognizing that not all students want to do that, what are we going to do with students who don't want to do role playing? And so the relevance to us, um, and this is, well, this kind of leads me at a good spot because these were questions that I had for you. So how do we respond to your needs? How do we respond to national needs? Because we really have to recognize that as a Galen, as an institution, we're here to respond to what's happening nationally. What do we need? What do our communities need? Um, and respond to the needs of who? To the institution. But if this institution is here, then are we here for you? Who are our other stakeholders that we also need to be responsive to? And then when I was talking about the journey, this really starts from the very beginning. Meeting a student, for marketing. How can we start to include being student-centered at that one moment when we're going out and meeting students and we're starting to do recruiting right now? The admissions and the enrollment. How fast is the turnover time? What's the application process like? How do we interact with students? Do we get them to connect with somebody who's in the program right then to answer all of their questions? Because I found out that it's not so obvious or simple as we think it is. And then, of course, the learning, and we've talked about that. And then graduation and what happens after graduation. Um, right, so what can we do for prospective students? What are we doing about the learning on and off campus? Um, and how can we work with our graduates after? How do we get there, the teaching and learning? It has to be a real shift in teaching and learning. It has to be accepted by everybody. You can't have one instructor who's not going to do it. And it's going to take a lot of retraining. So all of our instructors, all of our adjuncts who also have full-time jobs have to be willing to come in and say, okay, I'm willing to get retrained and this is what I'm going to do for it. Student action. And I talked about this just a little bit ago. It has to be accepted by you and you have to have involvement. And then the institutional policies, the institution has to buy in. There has to be commitment from faculty, students, the institution, and 
investment and financial investment. Um, talk about this. Okay, I want to close off with um, this. After we, um, the faculty had met before the semester started and I was talking about this and what are our ideas, what does student-centeredness mean for us? Um, Dr. Christian Daguerre came up with a statement and she sent, actually she sent it before, um, but I thought I would share it with you. So to let you know that we're actively thinking about this. We're trying to figure out what it means for us, but we also need to know if this is something that we really want to do. We're already marketing. We're saying we're student-centered. Some of you are already saying you're feeling that, which is great. Um, I would kind of say, I don't think we're there yet. But this is the statement that Dr. Daguerre had presented for us. She said, at Yale University, it is our unwavering mission to cultivate a dynamic and transformative learning environment that places students at the heart of the education journey. It's committed to fostering a culture of, of student-centeredness. We empower each individual to chart their unique path, guided by personalized support, such as peer mentoring, tutoring, and mental health counseling, innovative pedagogy, and collaborative engagement. By championing student empowerment, we equip students with the tools, confidence, and compassion to shape their futures, lead with integrity, and contribute meaningfully to their university community. I quite liked it, um, but, you know, this is not something that's just going to be accepted and that's it. Um, we need to see what you all would have in all of the stakeholders. So that's it. Thanks so much. I appreciate the participation. Sharing. Um, well, we are presented that can be easily turned around, but it's far more complex than that. What does it mean? And how does it have to do with where it starts, how it is taught, how the organizational uh, the institution is, is organized? Um, it hasn't has to do even with how the resources are managed, right? And I was thinking that perhaps one of the things also that might not have come out as clearly is the role of that institution in the larger society. I was at Penn State University, I think last year, and uh, there's a student movement to decarbonize the university and to get the university to divest its investments in oil. Right, because the young people are concerned about the climate crisis. So I was thinking, if the institution like Penn State is investing in something like oil, investing in something that's going to damage young people's life, uh, is that child-centered? Right? I'm mean, sorry, student-centered. So it also has to do with the place of the institution within the larger sort of uh, context, uh, what it's doing in, in the larger society. Um, it, I think the question of shell sentence re reminds me of a quote that I often use from Hannah Arendt, who's a philosopher, and she talks about with every child that is born, there's the possibility of renewing the world. With every child that is born, there's a possibility of renewing the world. In other words, each child brings the possibility of transforming the world. Okay, And the challenge of education then is how do we socialize the child how do we get the child to be incorporated into society without knocking off that child's hand the possibility of renewing the world? So how do we you know, educate the, the student while at the same time not removing the possibility that they might transform this entire world? I was thinking, yeah, maybe that's something there that has to do with child-centeredness or student-centeredness. That maybe is a key task. But I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Sherry for stimulating the conversation. And um, we said it's one hour. We've been a little bit over an hour. You're free to stay and continue talking about this, but I thought we'd just make sure that we say this an hour. So if you have to leave, you can leave. But maybe you have questions uh, that you want to ask or ideas that you want to share. Um, I'm certainly available for a few more minutes, and I think Sherry might be as well. Yeah. Well, I